Hello, I'm Phil Manson. This morning, we battled live stream's worst enemy. No internet. I want to apologize for that, but I uh, want you to still be able to stay in step with the church through our Philippians series entitled Living on the Edge of Whatever Happens. We're going to be, be reading from Philippians chapter 1, verses 18 through 26 here in just a moment. But uh, I want to uh, bring you up to speed on what's going to be happening in the life of the church over these next few weeks. First of all, next Sunday, uh, February 14th, we will be sharing in communion. And so but for those of you who worship with us online, uh, just to give you a heads up, that way you can have your elements prepared so that we can partake together next Sunday morning. And then on uh, uh, February the 17th, that's Ash Wednesday, we will be having an in-person service at 7 o'clock in the sanctuary, and uh, it will be a service of the ashes. But for those of you who are unable to come and worship with us in person, we will be having a drive-by ashes uh, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., up to the time of the service, and you can drive up in your car, and we will be out there to place the ashes on your forehead, and then you can return home, and then you can watch the service online at 7 p.m. And then on Sunday, February 21st, is our annual church election. And there will be three ways that you can vote. You can vote in person, that is, come to the, to the church like, we, like we've always done. A second way would be drive-by voting. That is, you can drive to the church at certain hours. We'll let you know that. But you can drive to the church at certain hours on Sunday, and we will give you, bring a ballot out to you. You can mark your ballot, place it in the uh, envelope, and then we can count that for the day. And a third option will be online, where you'll be able to vote online. Um, just be aware of that. We're going to be sending you an email that will describe the three ways that you can vote and give instruction for that. And so be watching for it. But February 21st will be annual church elections. At the end of a garbage-lined alley in Cairo, Egypt, is an American cemetery. And tucked in the northwest corner is the grave of William Whiting Borden heir to his father's silver mining fortune. Bill was a millionaire at the age of 21. He graduated from Yale and from Princeton Theological Seminary, but then he renounced his fortune and announced in the Chicago newspapers his harsh desire to take the gospel to the Muslims in northwestern China. One of his friends pleaded with him, don't throw your life away being a missionary. Well, on his way to China, Bill stopped in Cairo, in Cairo, Egypt, to study Arabic in order to communicate with the Chinese Muslims. But while there, he contracted spinal meningitis, and he died at the age of 25. Looks like he threw his life away. His death seemed to be a tragedy didn't accomplish what God had called him to do, what he had set out to do, and buried in that cemetery. You have to squeeze between the wall and the end of the tombstone in order to read the inscription that is at the bottom of the bottom of the of, of the tombstone, which says, Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. What's the explanation for your life? What's the explanation for mine? You know, that might seem like too deep of a question for this time of day, but maybe you're thinking, oh, I'm still trying to figure that out, or I'm not old enough, I haven't lived long enough to form an explanation for life. But Bill Boyden was seven years old when he stood in, at the front of Moody Church in Chicago. Stood there for a long time, committing his life to Jesus Christ. What's the explanation for your life, for my life? 
the book of Philippians is home to several memorizable lines. And we're going to read one of those lines that gives explanation for Paul's life. And it's found in Philippians 1, starting in the second half of verse 18. You can follow along with me. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, Paul says. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body, for you, that is, the Philippian Christian. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Did you catch the line that explained Paul's life? I bet it's underlined. I bet it is highlighted. I bet you have stars beside of it. It's marked up in your Bible. I want you to read it, repeat after me. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let's do it again. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Folks, that's, that's more than a slogan slapped on the side of a coffee mug that you're sipping from during morning prayer. It's more than just a, a bumper sticker we, we, we paste on the, on the back of the car on the way to church. You see, when Paul wrote this letter to the church at Philippi, he was living on the edge of whatever happens. His life was hanging in the balance. He was in chains. He was awaiting trial. And given the urgency of this paragraph, it seems like this trial is just right around the corner. It's imminent. You see, earlier Paul had been rejoicing that, that despite his chains and despite the envious preachers, the gospel was advancing. And he says, and yes, and I will continue to rejoice. That's future looking. But there's a, a sobering shift in his voice. Not, not a panicky dread of, I don't know what to do. But he says, what shall I choose? Or more likely, is, what shall I prefer? What do I prefer? The expression in this paragraph is one of intense mental gymnastics that doesn't show up in the smooth flow of the English, but in the Greek. The sentences are disjointed and the grammar is very awkward and it reflects the weighing of the pros and the cons, the certainty and the uncertainty, the, the, the deciding and not deciding, the desire to depart and the desire to remain. Most leaders would want to hide such a trampling of thoughts bounding through the mind, afraid it might reveal a weakness, an indecisiveness. But Paul lets the Philippian church in on his thinking. You see, he's writing to persuade them that, as we find in Philippians 4, 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Watch my example. And he's thinking out loud. He's kind of debating with himself, knowing that his thoughts on paper will be read, will be verbalized to the Philippian congregation. It shows just how much he trusted them with these thoughts. He's talking about living and dying. 
Because you, you don't talk about living and dying with just anybody. It's hard enough to talk about it with your, your, your spouse, your wife, your husband, your kids. Maybe you're, you're having the hard talk right now with a loved one. I remember when my mom and dad had to talk with my sister and me. That talk had to do with the will, where it was located, and the combination to the safe, and, and the insurance papers, and which funeral home to use, and which cemetery they wanted to be buried. That's a necessary conversation to have. But it's a whole other vulnerable level to expose your fears, your hopes, your theories, your doubts, your questions. And yet here's Paul. And he's given explanation for his life and death, even as it hangs in the balance. When, when you're living on the edge of whatever happens, the best explanation for our lives is what Paul says, to live is Christ. So let's immerse ourselves into the flow of Paul's thought and see if, see if we can be persuaded to adopt the same mindset as he had. Here's what he's convinced of. Here's the first point. Whatever happens, I will be delivered. Whatever happens, I will be delivered. We find that in verse 19. In verse 19, he says, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Paul was confident he was going to be delivered. De delivered, the, the Greek word there is soter which is the normal word for salvation or rescue. But what kind of salvation did Paul have in mind? Release from chains? Vindication at trial? Being set free from prison? Or was he talking about the final salvation? This exact phrasing that Paul uses will turn out for my deliverance is also found in Job chapter 13, verse 16. If we read it in the Septuagint, Septuagint is the, uh, is, is, is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so Paul's writing in the Greek, here's the Greek of the Old Testament, and so we find this same wording. And in Job 13, 16, he says, Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance. And then he goes on to say, I know I will be vindicated. Here's the sufferer Job, who had endured the accusatory arrows of his pious comforters, who said that he was in the position he was in because of hidden sin in his life, because of the shame, that that's the explanation for his problem, his downfall, his sickness, his loss of everything. Job pleads his innocence that even though God slay me, he believed that he ultimately will be vindicated and delivered by God, salvation. He didn't know if his earthly suffering would end with eternal glory, or if his body and his finances and his home will, be, will experience healing. But either way, this would turn out for my deliverance. And so similarly, Similarly, Paul, in the face of affliction, the affliction of chains and the attacks of rival preachers, he looks forward to vindication by God in the end. Now, it's highly unlikely that Paul is only thinking of release from prison or escaping the executioner's sword. What he's saying is that he will experience deliverance, salvation, whether the trial results in walking out of prison alive, earthly vindication, or carried out of jail a martyr, eternally vindicated. 
But notice that Paul isn't expecting deliverance in his own power. Because of their partnership in the gospel, Paul says, I know that through your prayers and God's provision, I know that through your prayers. Don't overlook that. You see, it's easy to imagine this, have this idealistic picture of Paul while we read through the book of Acts concluding that he possessed this natural, individualistic cowboy-like stamina to ride into town and stir up trouble and, and then endure ridicule and beatings and imprisonments that he experienced because of his faith in Christ. But Paul realized his own human frailty, his own weakness. And he's expressing an undeniable feeling of dependence on the prayers of the Philippian believers. Through your prayers. He's depending on them to sustain him as he faces the trial to determine whether he walked away a free man or a dead man. No doubt the Philippian believers were praying for his deliverance, his, his, his release from prison. Paul expects salvation too, maybe from prison, maybe just from death. Or it could be salvation too, eternity. Either way, what he, what he hopes for is that he will be provided sufficient courage through the Spirit to stand firm at his trial so that he doesn't bring shame to Christ through silence or denial of him, but rather that he will exalt him, whether by life or by death. In Russia, Ida Skripnikova was a 19-year-old Christian woman with movie star beauty and a, and a magnetic smile who stood outside the Museum of Atheism in Leningrad, handing out cards with poems. And the last line of the poem reads, Seek God while he may be found. That was against the law then. That was back in 1961 communist rule in Russia. And she was arrested. Didn't matter how pretty she was. Didn't matter about her magnetic smile. They didn't want God preached. And this was the first of four imprisonments she experienced throughout her life, especially over the next 20 years. And every time she was released, she went right back out onto the streets to share the gospel. People needed to hear that in such a godless country. And just two years ago, in an interview with her, she's 78 years old, she said, I have only been able to endure the trials because of the many prayers from around the world. Otherwise, I would not have persevered. The only way she made it is because of the prayers of many people around the world. See, salvation is the journey, and endurance to the end was not automatically guaranteed for Paul, or for Ida, or for us. Paul needed people praying for him. Ida needed people praying for her. We need people praying for us, and us for them. It was John Rushley who says, it seems God is limited by our prayer life, that he can do nothing for humanity unless someone asks him. Oh, folks, we, we need to learn to ask, learn to intercede on behalf of another who's facing trial. That they endure and that they have sufficient courage to give witness to Christ, to endure all things, so that they may be found blameless on the day of Jesus Christ. Whatever happens, pray that this will turn out for my deliverance. There's a second point here. We find this in verse 20. Whatever happens, 
past tense, but the first one was, whatever happens, I will be delivered. He was confident of that. Second thing, whatever happens, Christ will be exalted. You see what it says here? I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. In some mysterious way, the prayers of the Philippian believers are linked with God's furnishing of the Spirit to him. And together they provide help, the help that he needs to face Nero or the Roman jury with courage. In the Greco-Roman world of Paul's day, they, they operated under a culture of honor and shame. You, you avoided humiliation. You avoided public disgrace and dishonor at all costs in that culture. So with Paul's arrest and his jail time and his trial as a prisoner in chain, that would have brought humiliation to him and by extension to the church in the court of public reputation. But Paul does something here. He flips that whole notion upside down. He is confident that his imprisonment, his chains, his impending trial will not suffer him shame in the eyes of God, either in the present or in the future. He's expressing what the psalmist said in Psalm 25, 3, no one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. That's why he says, I eagerly expect and hope. Eagerly expect. That, that phrase there, that, that, the Greek word for eagerly expect, it's, it's, it's a very pic picturesque word. It, it denotes a state of keen anticipation about the future. It's kind of a craning of the neck, just stretching and, and standing on tiptoe, trying to see what's ahead. The ancient uh, Jewish historian Josephus, who is a contemporary of Paul's, he used the word in his writing to describe how in moments before the Roman armies attacked the Galilean city that he was responsible for, that he was responsible for defending, he wrote that he breathlessly awaited, eagerly expected, he breathlessly awaited the hail of arrows. He was expecting the arrows to come. It's not like he was looking forward to them. But he was ready for them. You're expecting the arrows, but you don't know if one of them might hit you or where it's going to hit you or how many are going to hit you. It's a picture of intense expectation that Paul had that through the prayers of the Philippian congregation and the provision of the Spirit, that when the arrows of the trial come flying to him, whatever happens, he will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And so as Paul awaits Rome's judgment in his case, he's not filled with dread, but he firmly anticipates that whether Rome gives the thumbs up or the thumbs down on his life, over his life, his very shame in Roman eyes will honor and magnify Jesus Christ. But also wrapped up in asking the Philippian church to pray for him, he, he's expressing the hope that he not do anything to disgrace his Lord. Shame the faith if things go badly for him at his trial. We might be thinking, huh, this is Paul. Paul ought to make it. Because thus far, Paul's received five times from the Jews lashings of 40 minus 1. Five times. Three times, three times he was beaten with rods. One time he was stoned and left for dead. Paul spent about five and a half, six years total in prison in three different locations. If Paul was going to give up, you would think it would have happened already. Uh, 
I've already mentioned that Paul's aware of his human frailty. But his greatest fear, the greatest shame for Paul is that he'll lack sufficient courage and shrink back in weakness, fail in his witness, or worse, deny Christ and the faith. I don't know about you, but that's, that's my greatest fear. And that's why I need your prayers. And that's why you need mine. That we be people who don't shrink back, but have sufficient courage to exalt Christ in our bodies, whether by life or by death. Every month I receive Voice of the Martyrs magazine. Story after story about the faith and the witness of Christians who live in areas of the world where persecution is, is common. I've read Richard, Richard Wormbrand tortured for Christ in the Romanian prison. Oh, for years, man, the guy suffered. It's a wonder he didn't give up. I have the book Jesus Freaks. Maybe you have it as well. There's a second volume also. But story after story of Christians through the ages who endured unspeakable torture, illegal and unjust arrests, burnings at the stake, beheadings at the hands of other religions, at the hands of communism, socialism, atheism, even the church. I wonder, do, do you, do I have sufficient courage to exalt Christ in the body, whether by life or by death? C.S. Lewis said, you never know how much you really believe anything until the truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. It is easy to say you believe a rope to be strong and sound as long as you are merely using it to cord a box, wrap it around a box. But suppose that you had to hang by that rope over a precipice. Wouldn't you then first discover how much you really trusted it? Only a real risk tests the reality of a belief. which leads us to the big point. Why to live is Christ and to die is gain is more than a cute little life motto. For Paul, whatever happened to live is Christ. To die is gain. This is the explanation for Paul's life. It is so laser-focused, it is so zeroed in, that some might say that Paul has tunnel vision. He's got his head buried in the sand, he can't see anything else. But you know, most people, they either have no vision, or they have a divided vision. Or they, 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 they have no explanation for their life, or, or they have a multiplicity of explanation for the chaos in their lives. In their lives. Sean Kierkegaard, who is a Danish philosopher and theologian, he, he said this, he said, purity of heart is the real one thing. A mind and a heart divided is a mind and a heart unable to be at peace with itself. And Jesus alluded to that fact, that many of us, many Christians have divided hearts. A Bible professor at Asbury Theological Seminary by the name of, name of Ben Witherington. He wondered out loud, he wondered, what would it be like to be passionate for Christ in the way that Paul was? Such that he could say that living is Christ. <clears throat> We're all living for something. For a variety of things. Oh, sure, living for Christ. 
We're living for families, we're living for work, we're living for our favorite sports teams, or, or even from the standpoint of survivors, or living about earning income, or to put food on the table, or raising a garden to, to do that same thing, or to provide a roof over your head. Life involves all these things, plus other things, maybe wealth accumulation, or leisure time, or hobbies, or entertainment, building, building friendships, building career, building a business, educating ourselves. But what would it be like to be so singularly, singularly focused that the explanation for our life is to live is Christ? What, what could it mean to live in, live out of, live for, live with Christ, with, with a passion that burned so hot that all other concerns, while not eliminated, were totally subjected to the central passion of one's life? Suppose that when Jesus told Martha that she was concerned about many things, but that only one was absolutely necessary. Did he mean it? Suppose he meant it. Suppose when Jesus said you cannot love both uh, money and God at the same time, suppose he meant it. Suppose that Je when Jesus said unless you deny yourself and take up the cross and follow him, we can't be his disciples, that he was serious. He, he meant what he said. Maybe if we try this little exercise in, in our quiet time someday, just write on a piece of paper, to live is, and then blank. What will you put in the blank? Oh, for me to live is oh, it's my motorcycle, oh, it's, my, it's my house, it's my, it's my, I mean, put whatever in the blank. Whatever you want, sports, career, family, your identity, there, there was a time in my life when, as shallow as it sounds, basketball would have been written in that blank. To live is best, that's all I did. But there's the other side of the equation that we have to deal with. To live is Christ and to die is gain. There's the other side we have to deal with. We don't get to fill in the blank on that side. That blank, the blank on that side, is filled in by the one who judges how we fill in the first blank. To live is blank. How do you fill that in? Because that makes the decision of what's going to be filled in on the other side. You see, that phrase, to live is Christ and to die is gain, is like a balance sheet. No, it's not a ring of, oh, here's my good things outweigh my bad. No, it's not like that. But it's an, it's an accounting type thing. It's, it's a balance sheet. Gain, the word gain is a business accounting kind of word. That what happens on one side of the balance sheet affects the outcome or the result on the other side. And so if we fill in the blank and truly live it out, to live is Christ, then God fills in the blank that to die is gain. It's a positive balance. But if the way we live fills in the blank for us on this side, to live is basketball. <laughs> and what do you think God's going to fill in in the blank to die is gain? I don't think so. It'll be loss. It'll be a negative balance. And I'm afraid that for most of us, living might be about too many things. Not centrally, not singularly about Christ. For most of us, if, if we were honest, truly honest, that blank would say, to live is me. I get the feeling that it might be easier to die for Christ than to live for him. We might call Bill Borden's death senseless. 
maybe even premature at 25. He had such a promising future ahead of him. But he didn't make it to China to be a missionary. But if we examine his living up to that point in his life, the 25 years, he lived what he wrote in his journal as a teenager, says no to self and just to Jesus every time. When Borden arrived at Yale University, he heard, he heard the university's uh, president speak at the, at the opening convocation when all the students were coming on the campus. And in his message to them, he said that, he said that every student needs to have a fixed purpose. But the part that disappointed Borden was that he neglected to say what that fixed purpose should be. And as Bill Borden walked through the campus, he lamented. He lamented what he saw in both the faculty and the students. He just saw empty humanistic philosophy in their lives. He saw moral weakness. He saw sin-ruined lives. Now, Borden was popular. He was good-looking. He was hard-working. He was athletic. He, he participated on the wrestling team and the crew team and uh, ran track and field. He, he became a leader on campus, being the president of various organizations. Yet, it was his saying yes to Christ that prompted him to begin a weekly prayer and Bible study group as a freshman. And his goal then was to invite and to reach every student on campus. That was his fixed purpose. He started with 150. And as it grew, he trained and formed more groups so that by, by the time he was a senior at Yale, 1,000 out of the 1,300 students on campus were a part of that Bible study and prayer movement. And the 300 who weren't a part, Borden made them his project. He targeted the most rebellious on campus. As a sophomore, using his own money, he established Yale Hope Mission in downtown New Haven, providing food and shelter and the gospel for the down and outs of New Haven, Connecticut. When a British, a visiting British theologian was asked about what he found most impressive about America? You know what he said? The sight of a young millionaire kneeling beside a bum at the Yale Hope Mission. He was talking about Borden. Senseless death? I have a feeling that Bill Borden lived more fully for Christ in his short 25 years than most of us live in 60. Because for him, his fixed purpose to live is Christ. He was an athlete, he participated. He was a leader, he participated. To live is Christ. Everything else was subjected to that. And that's what inspired one of his seminary professors to write as an epitaph on his tomb. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Say it with me again. To live is Christ. To die is gain. You know that's not the complete quote. If we really pay attention to it, it says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For to me, it's, it's a personal conviction. It was a personal conviction for Paul. This truth drove his life. It was his fixed purpose. It was the explanation for his life. 
So what's the explanation for your life? What's the explanation for mine? You see, when we're living on the edge of whatever happens, it matters for eternity. What's the explanation for my life? For your life? Maybe it's time for us to write in our journal, just like Bill Borden did when he was a teenager, to say no to self and say yes to Jesus every time. I'd like to pray with you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your, your great love for us. Your son Jesus had a singular purpose in coming for us. It was to give his life a ransom for many. There were those who tried to distract him to make him a king. Satan tried to tempt him away from his purpose. But he set his face on the cross. He knew why he was here. And he died buried, rose again. And because of his singular purpose, we too may have hope, the hope of eternal life. And Jesus, Lord, you think nothing different for us. That to live is to live for the Father. For us to live is to live for Christ. Hardest thing to do is to replace that blank, to remove the me and put in Christ. Father, I know that there are folks who are watching this who are toying with that decision. In the words of Paul, yet what shall I choose? Help us to choose. Help us to be persuaded. To write in the blank, to me, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. So Lord, I give you thanks for your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts and minds. Grant us sufficient courage to make that decision when things are calm. So that we may be ready for the day when we have to face the trials ourselves. We just give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with me through this, uh, this message. God bless you.